Tonight, the Supreme Court shakeup. Justice Stephen Breyer set to retire. The liberal justice to step down at the end of his term this summer after more than 27 years on the high court. President Biden now able to nominate his first Supreme Court justice before the midterm elections. And while Democrats have control in the Senate, the potentially historic nominees who could fill the seat. Also tonight, more than 220 million Americans under freezing temperatures, heavy snow shutting down parts of a highway in Colorado. And in Utah, crews rescuing a woman trapped in icy waters. Now, the nor'easter threat. Parts of the east could see up to 20 inches of snow this weekend. Al Roker joins Top Story. The U.S. warning Russia. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the U.S. has delivered a document to Moscow about what would happen if the country invades Ukraine. NATO allies now mobilizing across Eastern Europe as Russia continues to hold military drills near the border. Richard Engel in Ukraine tonight and former NATO Supreme Allied Commander James Devridis joins us live. Botch ransom plot. The teenagers arrested after luring a man on social media for money and then killing his brother. The victim's mother speaking a top story about the moment she found out her sons were in danger. Hero officer, the body cam footage showing an L.A. police sergeant saving the life of a choking toddler. What he told me about the training and paternal instincts that kicked in. And cool runnings, the Jamaican bobsled team qualifying for the Winter Olympics for the first time in more than 20 years. Their incredible journey to Beijing, including how they used a Mini Cooper to train when COVID shut down all the gyms. Top story starts right now. And good evening. We begin top story tonight with that major headline from Washington. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer set to retire. And the question now, who could replace him? The 83-year-old is the court's oldest member and has served as an associate justice since he was appointed by President Clinton in 1994. He's expected to step down at the end of the current term this summer. Breyer is one of the three remaining liberal justices and has been under pressure to retire ahead of the midterm elections. It will be President Biden's first opportunity to fill a Supreme Court vacancy. He promised during his campaign that he would put the first black woman on the high court. Whoever his nominee is, it will likely be a fierce confirmation battle, and Democrats will need full party support. The Senate split 50-50, plus Vice President Kamala Harris as a tiebreaker. We begin tonight with the reporter who broke this story, NBC News Justice correspondent Pete Williams. He leads us off tonight from Washington. People close to Justice Breyer say he made the decision to step down within the past several weeks and prepared to formally notify the White House this week. At age 83, he's the court's oldest justice and appears to be in good health. He remains highly productive, writing some of last term's headline decisions. But he's also a political realist, a former staffer on the Senate Judiciary Committee who knows how Washington works. He was well aware that some progressives said Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg stayed on the court too long despite battles with cancer. Her death allowed President Trump to appoint Amy Coney Barrett, giving the court a super solid six to three conservative majority. Breyer said last fall that he knew of the pressure for him to step down while Democrats control the White House and the Senate, which would vote on confirming his successor. I have most of the considerations in mind, and I simply have to weigh them and think about them and decide when the proper time is. I've also said that I, don't, I hope I don't die on the Supreme Court. Any nominee of President Biden's to succeed Justice Breyer, if confirmed, would maintain that current 6-3 ideological split. I, Stephen Breyer, do solemnly swear. Bill Clinton nominated Breyer, then a federal judge in Boston, to the Supreme Court in 1994. He was confirmed 87 to 9. Breyer quickly established himself as one of the Supreme Court's moderate liberals, who believed that interpreting the Constitution must be practical, changing with the times. The reason that I do that is because law, in general, I think, grows out of communities of people who have some problems they want to solve. He wrote the court's opinion striking down a state law that banned some late-term abortions. He supported affirmative action and other civil rights measures. And in a widely noted dissent in 2015, he said the death penalty in America had become so arbitrary that it was probably unconstitutional. His real legacy probably is trying to take the law in a pragmatic direction. He wanted the law to work. He didn't want just abstract legal rules that made no sense in the real world. Justice Breyer will be around at least until late June when the term ends, voting on the challenge to abortion rights and Roe v. Wade, as well as cases on gun rights and religious freedom, one of the most important terms in years. 
a lot of big decisions still ahead. Pete joins us now live from Washington. So, Pete, do we know when we should expect a formal announcement from Justice Breyer? And explain to our viewers, I know you touched upon it there in your story, the thinking of the timing on this announcement. Sure. I think we'll hear the formal announcement tomorrow. It sounds like it's going to be something at the White House. We've not seen his letter yet, so we don't know if his resignation or his retirement will take place at the end of the current term when, the, when they finished handing down the decisions in late June or early July or whether he'll wait until his successor is nominated and confirmed by the Senate. But the timing is that unless if he doesn't step down now, then there's a danger that the Senate would lose, the Democrats would lose control in the Senate and the president could no longer get his nominee through. That's the reason for the timing. You know, Pete, there in your story, we just heard you point out that whomever Biden appoints will maintain the ideological split of the court. But presidents do have to be careful. There are always justices <laughs> that sometimes surprise us and su surprise presidents. Sure. There are many historical examples of that. Uh, Justice Souter, for example, uh, Justice Brennan. Uh, so I, I think one thing you might say is it's very possible that whoever Joe Biden nominates to succeed him might actually be more liberal than Stephen Breyer was because he was a moderate to liberal justice, a big believer in the administrative state, not always somebody who ruled for criminal defendants, for example. So it's possible that uh, this new justice, whoever it is, if it's, if, it's a, if it's a Biden nominee, could be more liberal than he was. All right, Pete Williams breaking the biggest story so far this year. Pete, we appreciate it. All eyes now on that soon-to-be empty seat. President Biden has promised he would appoint the first black woman to the court. His administration tonight addressing rumors that Vice President Kamala Harris is under consideration. Here's NBC's chief White House correspondent, Peter Alexander, with a look at who's on the short list. Shown some real results. Tonight, President Biden preparing to wield one of the presidency's most consequential powers, picking a Supreme Court nominee, though saying little about it today. There has been no announcement from Justice Breyer. Let him make whatever statement he's going to make, and I'll be happy to talk about it later. Now the focus turns to the president's short list, with the White House today saying President Biden will stick to this campaign promise. I'm looking forward to making sure there's a black woman on the Supreme Court to make sure we, in fact, get every representation. President Biden has nominated eight black women to federal appellate courts so far, and one of the top contenders for the Supreme Court opening comes from that list. 51-year-old Katanji Brown Jackson, a Harvard Law graduate who formerly clerked for Justice Breyer, nominated just last year by President Biden for the influential U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. I'm even-handedly applying the law in every case. Jackson won confirmation in the Democratic-controlled Senate with support from all 50 Democrats and three Republicans. Another likely frontrunner, 45-year-old Leandra Kruger, a justice on California's Supreme Court. Kruger, a former Justice Department lawyer, has argued several cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. The White House tonight brushing off speculation that President Biden might nominate Vice President Harris. The president has every intention, uh, as he said before, of running for re-election and for running for re-election with uh, Vice President Harris on the ticket as his partner. The pick will not change the balance of the conservative court, but for President Biden, with inflation soaring, his agenda stalled and poll numbers sinking, it's a chance for a much-needed political win. All right, Peter Alexander joins us now from a huge day at the White House. So, Peter, how soon can we expect to see President Biden announce a nominee? Yeah, Tom, it's a good question, and people, uh, people familiar with that process tell NBC News that President Biden is going to try to put forward that nominee quickly. It is something that the president has thought about since before taking office. Even during the transition, top advisors to then-candidate Biden, President-elect Biden, gave him a formal presentation about the best potential candidates, Tom. And, Peter, just to be absolutely clear, because we saw this in your story, there is no chance that that nominee is going to be the vice president. Well, in this business, we never, we never say no chance, but the White House certainly got as close as they possibly could to ruling it out altogether there. The president, to this point, has now nominated 19 black women to the federal courts. Uh, Kamala Harris, who, of course, served as the attorney general in California in the past before becoming that state's senator, ultimately becoming the vice president. The White House says the president expects her to be on the ticket with him in 2024.
Peter Alexander from the White House tonight for us. Peter, thank you. We turn now to the weather, an Arctic blast covering most of the U.S. Millions bundled up against below freezing temperatures, heavy snowfall and near whiteout conditions, shutting down interstates and causing collisions. Jackknife semi-trucks sliding off icy roadways, one even dangling off an overpass in Indiana. Maura Barrett has the latest for us tonight. Tonight, the Arctic cold blanketing most of the nation. Over 220 million people battling below freezing temperatures. This is bitter cold. I almost got frostbite. In the Northeast, the brutal cold bringing real field temperatures of negative 7 to Syracuse and negative 2 to Boston. We are talking about, again, waking up and feeling sub-zero pretty much statewide. Overnight, firefighters struggling in New Prague, Minnesota, fighting a massive plant fire in negative 13 degrees. Steam pouring off of their gear and water freezing in the frigid temperatures. Out west, the brutal weather causing chaos for Colorado's drivers. I smacked right into the rear end of him because he was facing sideways. In Burlington, heavy snowfall shutting down a major interstate. Jackknife trucks and stranded cars littering I-70. Motorists struggling to maintain control on messy roadways. In Utah, a stunning rescue. Officials hoisting this woman to safety after ice trapped her car, the driver receiving medical attention. And in the Midwest, this FedEx truck dangling over the side of a bridge in Indiana after skidding off an icy road. Some areas in Kansas seeing over two feet of snow. Those blinding near whiteout conditions making travel treacherous for motorists. And postal workers in Iowa battling the cold blast too. We got cleats for the ice, we got gloves, hand warmers, toe warmers, layers, layers, layers. All right, Maura Barrett joins us now from a chilly Chicago tonight. Maura, so we saw there that FedEx truck dangling off the overpass. Couldn't stop thinking about that. Do we know what happened there? Such a precarious position for that truck, right, Tom? And so what happened was the FedEx truck was trying to avoid hitting other vehicles that were slowing down because of ice on the road. He did end up hitting another car. The, the driver was transported, complaining of pain, but was ultimately released, which is great news, but obviously a big item of concern as viewers might be getting on the road tonight. More freezing temperatures expected overnight, so make sure they're watching out for black ice or stay off the road if you can. And taking advice from that postal worker there, I can confirm here in, in Chicago, it's real field negative four. So layering up, getting those hand warmers out is really the name of the game here tonight, Tom. All right, Maura, thank you for that. In addition to those brutally cold temperatures, the Northeast is bracing for a potentially major snowstorm this weekend. So we want to bring in our friend Al Roker, who is tracking all of this for us tonight. Al, this is going to be a big storm. Yeah, absolutely. And here's the deal. We're, we're still looking at a really cold air that's locked in from Chicago, Buffalo, Nashville, Raleigh, up to New York and on into Boston right into the weekend. So that sets the stage. So here's the European model. It stays fairly close to the coast. Heavy snow from New Jersey up to Maine. We're we're talking not just inches, but could be feet. The American model is a little further away. The heaviest snow, coastal New England from Boston on up into new parts of northern New England. But here's the problem. We look at this. We're trying to divide, you know, kind of divide it up. So we've blended the models together. We think the heaviest snow is going to be, again, right along the New England coast, Long Island, on into coastal New Jersey. Heavy snow, interior New York, uh, upstate New York, into New England. Pennsylvania and the Delmarva Peninsula, lighter snow elsewhere, Tom. But again, the, the European model, uh, six to eight inches in New York City. The American model, one to two inches. Yeah, those, those models seem to always be fighting each other. We'll, yeah. we'll see who's right later on. I do want to ask you something. You said you and your team were tracking something very interesting, and it comes to the temperature of the water. Usually we talk about hurricanes uh, when, with this issue, but now we're talking about winter storms? Yeah, yeah. here's the deal. Uh, with climate change, we're seeing this, these warmer waters. Well, the Gulf Stream you know, runs up along the East Coast. It provides energy and moisture for coastal storms. Well, as this happens, just happening right now, water temperature in this box, the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf of uh, Maine, I should say, up to 10 degrees above average. That's cold. That is climate change right there. So the warm ocean currents along the East Coast, as this system moves up, we get that ocean energy bombogenesis. We watch the pressure drop nearly 30 millibars in 24 hours, hurricane force winds possible, and even even all that snow, so we've got some blizzard conditions. So, Tom, this is going to be one way or the other a real mess.
All right, Al Roker, who will be very busy over the next few days. Al, thank you. To the other major headline now, the growing crisis in Ukraine. Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying today that the U.S. offered Russia a, quote, serious diplomatic path forward, but rejected Russia's demand to ban Ukraine from joining NATO in the future. This as Russia ramps up its military drills on the border of Ukraine. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel reports tonight from the ground in Ukraine. This time, Russia mobilized its ships in the Black Sea as it continues its military buildup for a possible invasion of Ukraine. A Western intelligence official tells NBC News Russia tonight has 112 to 120,000 troops on Ukraine's borders in 60 battalion tactical groups, with more, maybe many more, on the way. Russia says it's all in response to what the foreign minister today called hysterical threats from the West to attack Russia and punish it with sanctions, insisting Russia will not invade. Diplomatically, the United States formally gave Russia written answers as requested, which fell far short of Vladimir Putin's sweeping demand that NATO expansion since the collapse of the Soviet Union be undone and Ukraine never be allowed to join. I can tell you that it reiterates what we've said uh, publicly uh, for many weeks <laughs> and in a sense for many, uh, many years, uh, that um, we will uphold the principle of NATO's uh, open door. Tom, Western officials were speaking to are hardening up their anticipation. It used to be that perhaps there would be an invasion, that they saw signs that there could be an invasion. Now it is that they expect some kind of invasion. And they say that if it does happen, it will likely involve cyber to cut the Internet here and missile strikes. Tom? It would involve both there. Okay, Richard Engel with that new reporting tonight. For insight and analysis on the escalating tension in Ukraine, we want to bring in NBC News Chief International Security and Diplomacy Analyst and former NATO Supreme Allied Commander, Admiral James Stavridis. Admiral, first off, thank you so much for joining Top Story again tonight. I want to show our viewers a map, and I want you to walk our viewers through all of this. This is a map that the Wall Street Journal put up on their site. It's provided by Dr. Philip Carber. He's a Russia expert. And I want to just tell our viewers quickly what they're looking at. All these red dots right here. These are military force locations from Russia. So you can kind of see how they surround Ukraine. The yellow are Russia proxy forces. The blue, those are Ukrainian forces, obviously, and green is Belarusian forces. So my question to you, Admiral, is when you see this map, what does it tell you and where do you think the Russians invade? Where do they start the invasion? Let's um, let's deconstruct this slightly because I think to a lot of viewers, it looks like a Jackson Pollock painting with just dots everywhere. There are only three things you need to understand. From the north, where it says Belarus, that would be about one third of the effort. From the east, directly from the right side of the screen coming in from Russia itself. And from the south, including, as you noted in uh, our friend Richard Engel's excellent report, naval operations coming up from the south around Crimea, that little portion that is dangling down into the Black Sea, which Russia already owns. So, Tom, this is a potential three-vector attack from the north, from the east, and from the south. Russia has amassed sufficient forces to do that. It's a very dangerous moment. And, Admiral, I, I've been in background briefing calls with you as well, and I know there's something that concerns you. If we look to just the west of Ukraine, this tiny little dot over here, according to this map, it's a Russian infantry unit. It's in the country of Moldova. You've said this also concerns you a little bit. It does. Anytime you're involved in a military operation, what you don't want to see is your opponent either around your flanks on the left or the right or the worst of all, behind you, because that's where your command and control is. That's where your admirals and your generals are operating. That's where your logistics comes from. So Russia has a significant advantage having the ability to tap into the forces they have effectively prepositioned behind the Ukrainian front lines. Again, a dangerous scenario for our friends in Ukraine. Admiral, I want to talk about weapons right now. And let's start with the Javelin missiles. We've talked about this so much. These are weapons the Americans are giving to the Ukraines. Talk to us about this weapon and why it would be so important for Ukraine. These are surface-to-surface -surface missiles, which means simply that a soldier, like you see in that photograph, holds it 
and then launches it, but they are deadly to tanks and to armored personnel carriers. This is how the Russians are going to move their troops into Ukraine. So many of us can recall during Afghanistan when the Russians were there, the Soviets were there, the Mujahideen were using stingers. I'm sure you've got a picture of stingers as well. There you go. To go from surface to air, these javelins are the equivalent of stingers going surface to surface. We ought to be flooding the zone with stingers and javelins. That's how we slow down the Russian advance. And Admiral, I want to point out something important because it leads me to the next discussion here. These are all shoulder fired here. You can see uh, some people have been talking about another weapon that is so important to the American artillery, and that's, of course, the Patriot missile. But there's a problem here because I, I've heard U.S. representatives, military experts saying they don't want to give the Patriots to the Ukrainians just yet because it takes training. And clearly this is no longer a sh shoulder fired weapon. That's exactly right. These are vastly, the Patriot, vastly more complicated. Effectively, Tom, you would have to have U.S. boots on the ground there to operate these systems. We're not ready to go there. We can do a lot of damage to the Russians with these shoulder-fired stingers. Let's go with that first. Let's see how the first volleys go. Final thought here, Tom, it's not only going to be tanks and troops and missiles. A big part of this, as you heard Richard say, is going to be cyber. Watch for that first cyber attack to knock down the Ukrainian electric grid and go after Ukrainian command and control nodes. That clearly could be a first step in this. I do want to talk to you about this while we have you, because I think this is important to our viewers. The Ukrainian military, about 200,000 active personnel compared to Russia, nearly a million. When we talk about NATO, a combined force of about 40,000 troops. You don't have to be a mathematician, Admiral, to add these numbers up. Clearly, Russia has the upper hand here. When you look at a number like this, is that why our president said just yesterday, this could be like World War II if things get out of control? Indeed, if we lose control of the ladder of escalation and both sides really throw their military might at this problem, let's not forget, back there behind Ukraine, NATO has three million troops on active duty, almost all of them volunteers. Russia has only about a million troops, most of them draftees. So, Let's hope we don't get to the point where we're working those numbers. The numbers you are showing are in Ukraine itself. And I'll close here by saying, Tom, that the Ukrainian armed forces, 200,000 active duty, take a look at those 900,000 reserves. These are motivated, highly armed, trained reservists. And Russia has 900,000 total. They're spread over the entire range of Russia. The invasion force would probably only be 150,000. So Ukraine can defend here. This is not going to be a layup for Vladimir Putin. Admiral Severides, we thank you for your time. We also thank you for walking our viewers through what is a very complicated military matter. Again, we appreciate your time. All right, turning now to another big story we're following. The interest rates remain unchanged today, but that will likely change with the Fed signaling they could increase them as soon as March. The Federal Reserve's announcement comes as we're still dealing with the pandemic, major supply chain disruptions, and high inflations. These issues rattling Wall Street this week, but hitting Main Street especially hard. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns has more. Tonight, the Federal Reserve signaling its plans to pull back on some of its pandemic policies. Interest rates remain unchanged, but the central bank indicating a quarter percentage point increase could come soon, likely in March. The Fed's signal meant to tame inflation. We're committed to our price stability goal. But Fed Chair Jerome Powell making it clear the economic impact of the pandemic is not behind us. If the wave passes quickly, the economic effects should as well. That said, the implications for the economy remain uncertain. The market closing slightly in the red today, moving lower after the announcement, as increasing interest rates are generally bad for stocks. But the long-term concern is still inflation up at 40-year highs, hitting Main Street hardest. If you're in the market for a car, you'll have to pay up. The price of new cars up almost 12%. Used cars, 37 percent, and gas prices up nearly 50 percent year over year. Disruptions in every level of the supply chain are also putting upward pressure on prices, from manufacturing plants in China to store shelves here in the U.S. It's a new obstacle every single day. Catherine Lynn works for the Greater Boston Food Bank, where inflation is impacting the most vulnerable. 
leading factors for people uh, attending our pantries, which we're hearing directly from our pantries, is the high cost of food in the grocery stores. Grocery prices surged 6.5% in 2021, the biggest increase in 13 years. But the high prices and supply shortages leading people to the Greater Boston Food Bank are also hitting the organization itself. They're all persisting and challenging our operations today as they were a couple of months ago. We first visited the food bank, one of the largest in the country, over Thanksgiving. They were facing major challenges preparing for a spike in need during the holidays. We're seeing price increases between 10 and 20 percent on um, those critical staple items that you have in a holiday meal. And since then bananas are up 10 percent eggs are actually up 43 percent apples 20 percent canned vegetables 20 percent um, so you know all these really staple items that you know you'll find in a lot of our pantries are all costing more all right dasha joins us now live from here in 30 rock so dasha it's not just grocery prices there are a lot of factors squeezing american families right now what issues did the food bank point to in terms of why people are showing up in need of their services right now yeah, Tom, that's exactly right. The folks we spoke with say there's a wide range of factors at play that are putting a strain on families. The ending of unemployment assistance has had a big effect. Universal school meals that families rely on for their kids have been disrupted with Omicron disrupting classes. And the child tax credit ending, which was a huge lifeline for so many families. Food pantries say they're seeing the impact of the end of that program right now in real time, Tom. All right, Dasha Burns for us tonight. Dasha, thank you for more on this big news out of the Federal Reserve today and what it means for you. Let's bring in NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule. Steph, thanks for joining Top Story tonight. Let's get right to it. I have two quick questions for you. First, how will this affect people looking for a mortgage to buy a home, car loans and credit cards? And also with that March timeline, should people act now if they can? Well, think about this. Come March, we are expecting a rate hike. Remember, we're coming from zero, so even a hike, we're just going to get a little bit higher. We're not talking two, three, four percent territory. It's just a quarter of a point. However, that will affect things like getting a new mortgage, any sort of bank loan, your credit cards. So think about it now. If you have a floating rate mortgage, this is a time that you might want to try it in and get it fixed. This is a time you might want to refinance your mortgage. And if you've got a big purchase you're planning on, take out that loan now and try to pay down your debt on your credit cards if you can. That's what you want to do in the immediate. But don't get yourself too panicked because remember, the overall goal why the Fed is doing this is because they're trying to slow the pace of inflation. So as much as we might not like to pay a bit more when we're going out to get a loan, the bigger concern is that inflation is pushing everything in our lives so much more expensive, and hopefully it's going to tackle that. Yeah, great advice, and you're definitely putting it into perspective there. So for the last few days, the stock market has been on a bit of a roller coaster. How much do you think this is tied to the Fed versus stocks were really high and we're getting back now to what may be reality? Well, both of those things are connected. One of the reasons stocks were really high is because of the Fed's intervention. When the Fed sets interest rates at zero, that means there's nowhere else to invest. You can't, you're not making any money if you're, if, you're, if you're keeping your savings in a savings account. You can't invest in bonds because you're getting no returns. So the only place to go is the stock market. And when the Fed then starts to raise rates, well, then there's other places where you could earn on your money. And so this sort of takes the safety blanket, the safety net away from the markets. And yes, it's uncomfortable to see volatility. But remember, Tom, volatility is a normal function of the markets. People have gotten accustomed to this idea that like, oh, the market only goes up. It doesn't. The market moves up. The market moves down. And to be honest, we are getting, and you said this a moment ago, closer to fundamentals. And that's a better place to be because when the market just keeps climbing and climbing, you're in bubble territory. When that bubble gets too big, it doesn't correct. It pops. Let's expand on that idea because the Tina phrase is sometimes used in investing, which of course stands for there is no alternative. And for the last several years, stocks were so great, the investments kept going up and up. Real estate was too expensive. Bonds were low and stocks were booming. Do you see a shift coming now? Absolutely. Think about this. In the last two years, the housing market was hot, hot, hot. People kept saying, well, it's the pandemic. People want to move out to the suburbs. They want to buy a country house. That wasn't just about wanting to change your lifestyle. People could buy houses because it was so cheap to get a mortgage, right? If you can borrow cheap, you will. And so by raising rates, 
that slows things down. It makes it a bit more expensive in the housing market. It, it lessens demand. And one of the things that pushes prices higher and higher is demand. And when demand drops, well, then prices will drop too. Stephanie Rule for us tonight. Steph, thank you for that. Still ahead, a dire situation off the coast of Florida, a boat capsizing with nearly 40 people on board, the desperate search for survivors tonight. Also, the moment an officer is shot during a traffic stop, his bulletproof vest saving his life, the officer continuing to chase the suspect even after he was hit, and the botched ransom plot that started on social media but ended in a murder. The teenagers arrested Plus, what the victim's mother is now telling top story. This story coming up right after the break. Stay with us. Back now on Top Story, an 18-year-old charged with murder, finally in custody after avoiding arrest for a month. It's all tied to an alleged kidnapping plot gone wrong. Police say the suspects used the social media app Snapchat to abduct a man and then killed his brother after demanding a ransom. Zinclay Esamwa has more. Tonight, after nearly a month on the run, an 18-year-old turns herself in, now in custody in connection to the murder of a former corrections officer. Two people charged after an alleged botched 2021 ransom plot, which began on the social media app Snapchat, according to police. My youngest son called me screaming that my son, Elias, had been shot. I jumped in the car immediately. I got there in five minutes. I watched him die right in front of my face, and it was horrific. The victim, Elias Otero, 24, engaged to be married. Instead, the family left to plan a funeral. He dedicated his life to law enforcement, and um, he was about to get married. Um, he didn't get to do any of that. Elias killed in front of his home February 11th of last year in Albuquerque, New Mexico. A 17-year-old minor whose face we've blurred was charged with murder, kidnapping, two counts of armed robbery, and tampering with evidence. He turned himself in last month. Now Annabella Dukes, 18, faces the same charges and is in custody. Police say Dukes allegedly used Snapchat to lure Elias' brother, Nicholas Otero, 20, to Alvarado Park in New Mexico. Nicholas was then kidnapped and carjacked by three people. Police say they drove to Elias' house, video calling him and demanding $1,000 ransom, threatening to kill his brother if he didn't comply. According to law enforcement, Elias went outside with a gun but was immediately killed. The suspects fled and Nicholas escaped. The minor's lawyer says he has entered a plea of not guilty, adding, quote, let this process play out. He enjoys the presumption of innocence, and there is very little by way of direct evidence at this point. Two suspects are now in custody. One is expected to have a first hearing in two days. What do you want to see? I want to see him kept behind bars. Elias's mom, Alicia Otero, started a community group advocating for tougher bail laws and longer sentences for violent offenders. I want the people who were involved, all of them, uh, to be put in prison. I want them to stay there. This incident swept up in the city's unprecedented year for homicides, Albuquerque hitting more than 100 killings in 2021 for the first time on record. New Mexico's governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, pledging. And we are going to pass a law this session that will keep violent criminals behind bars until justice can be done. Her proposal, a 19% raise for New Mexico police and hiring a thousand more officers. All while community members, like Elias's mother, make calls for action. We're tired of this. We're tired of the violence. Everyone needs to uh, put the guns down. All right, Zinclay joins us now from here in 30 Rock. And Zinclay, I understand this isn't the only carjacking case Anna Dukes and the other suspects are linked with? Yeah, Tom, that's right. The suspects fled the scene, but detectives were able to identify their vehicle with security footage and later linked it to a previous carjacking. We still don't know the identity of the other two alleged kidnappers. We also did reach out to the police department for more details and Snapchat, where many of the conversations with the suspects happened, according to police, and they did not immediately respond to our request for comment. Tom. All right, Sinclair, thank you for that. Next up, Michael Avenatti, the once prominent attorney who represented adult film actress Stormy Daniels against then President Donald Trump back in the spotlight in his own criminal trial. But this time, Stormy Daniels is the one accusing her former attorney. Tom Winter has more. Tonight, Michael Avenatti, the man who gained prominence fighting alongside adult film star Stormy Daniels against Donald Trump, now pitted against her in a criminal trial. 
Avenatti had previously represented Daniels in her legal battle to speak out about an affair she says she had with Trump. Now prosecutors are accusing Avenatti of stealing nearly $300,000 from Daniels, advance money she says she was owed for her 2018 autobiography, Full Disclosure. Avenatti making the unusual move of representing himself in this trial. I'm a trial lawyer. It's what I've done for two decades. It's my arena. It's where I'm most at home. And I think it gives me the best chance at winning. And it gives the best chance for the truth and the evidence to come out. Why would Michael Avenatti choose to represent himself pro se now in this case? The answer is simple, ego. He thinks he can do a better job than his lawyers that he's paying fees to. In opening statements, prosecutors said this case is about a lawyer who stole from his client, a lawyer who lied to cover up for the scheme. They also accused Avenatti of forging Daniels' signature in a fake letter to her publisher. I am completely innocent in this case. It should have never been brought, and I'm hopeful that the jury at the end of the case is going to agree. But Avenatti is already facing two and a half years in jail after he was convicted of trying to extort Nike. And in a third case, he faced allegations he embezzled money from clients in California, a case which ended in a mistrial. He says he is innocent in all these cases. Daniels, whose legal name is Stephanie Clifford, is also suing Avenatti in civil court. She could take the stand as soon as Thursday to answer questions first from prosecutors and then face cross-examination by Avenatti himself. Avenatti is an experienced lawyer, and that civil skill can translate over to the criminal side. But he's still a person charged with a crime who's emotionally invested in his own case. And that could be his undoing. All right, Tom joins us now in studio. So, Tom, as you laid out there in the story, this is pretty bizarre. It actually <laughs> almost seems like the plot of a bad movie or a funny movie, I should say. You know, there is going to be a point where Michael Avenatti is going to be able to cross-examine Stormy Daniels, and there could be fireworks there, but you were just telling me there are some parameters he has to follow. Right. So, I mean, certainly he could get into all sorts of interesting areas with Stormy Daniels, and could we hear some things we haven't heard before about their interactions or her interactions with Trump? It's possible, but really he has to play in the sandbox that the prosecutors build for him. He has to address and ask questions that have to do with the testimony she provides to prosecutors that has to go with this case. And you know what? Tom, a wise attorney once said to me, you never want to ask a witness a question in court where, where you don't think you already know the answer. So in other words, don't ask things, Michael Avenatti, uh, that you may not know what Stormy Daniels says. That's a potential big concern for him. It'll be interesting to see how it all plays out, possibly as soon as tomorrow. And if that happens, we'll have you right back here. All right, Tom, thank you. When we come back, chemical plant explosion, the blast in Louisiana, injuring several workers. What officials are saying about the air quality. Stay with us. All right, time now for Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the search for survivors after a suspected human smuggling boat capsized off the coast of Florida. At least one man was found. You see him right there clinging to the boat in the waters near Port St. Lucie. That's off the coast of Florida. He says the boat from the Bahamas was carrying nearly 40 people when it overturned in bad weather. So far, at least one body has been recovered. It's still unclear where the migrants originated from. Several people are injured after an explosion at a chemical plant in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Westlake Chemical says a tank that was undergoing maintenance exploded, sparking a fire. At least six workers were hurt, including five sent to the hospital. The fire was extinguished. All shelters in place were lifted, and officials say there is no impact on the air quality. A Georgia sheriff's deputy is lucky to be alive thanks to his bulletproof vest. Take a look at this body cam footage. It shows the moment a driver pulls out a gun covered with a rag and shoots the officer in the chest during a traffic stop. The officer then gets back in his vehicle and chases the suspect using a pit maneuver to stop him. The 24-year-old is now facing aggravated assault charges. That officer is expected to be okay. Next tonight, schools overrun by Omicron are desperate for help with the surge in cases fueling a teacher shortage. Some districts in New Mexico turning to the National Guard. That's right, the National Guard to keep classrooms open. NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz is on the ground for us tonight in Los Lunas, New Mexico. In classrooms across New Mexico, the National Guard taking up teaching posts during an education emergency. Does it say its name or does it say eh, Peg? Service members in both uniform and civilian clothing substitute teaching during an unprecedented shortage of educators. I rose my hand right away and said it's absolutely necessary and I'd love to help. Is she a good substitute? 
Yeah? Yeah. For Airman Amaraya Hiron, stepping up is personal. Seven years ago, she was a student in the very math class she's now overseeing. I was excited. I was like, I want to volunteer for that and help out because I'm from this area. And I know even when I was in school, there was short staffing. The superintendent says with the recent surge of Omicron, almost every day is a scramble to get classrooms covered. What does a bad day look like for you? We've had as many as 25% of our teaching staff out in a day. So far, 50 National Guard members have received rapid certifications to substitute. Since the pandemic, teacher vacancies have nearly doubled with over 1,000 unfilled positions. That means 20,000 students without permanent teachers in their classrooms. And the need for subs is just one part of a growing problem. New Mexico ranks last in the nation in education. This has been the hardest year because we're dealing with the traumas that our students experience during that time. Kids that we have back on campus aren't the same. We're having to reteach them how to study. We're having to reteach how to have them interact with individuals. And as Omicron takes more teachers out of the classroom, reinforcements are arriving, while the state does all it can to keep schools open. Have a good lunch. Okay, Gotti, I got to tell you, it's pretty shocking to see those National Guard troops there in the classroom. We salute the effort. Um, I know you know about this issue firsthand. Yeah, talk about a story hitting close to home. Uh, I grew up here in New Mexico. Most of my family uh, works in schools in New Mexico. And over the past couple of weeks, four of them are at home because of COVID-19. In fact, my dad is a high school teacher in Albuquerque. He's out with COVID right now. My little brother, he's a second grade teacher. He was out last week. Fortunately, they were able to get substitutes because they live in Albuquerque. Uh, and the program that we're seeing right now with the National Guard is really reaching a lot of the rural areas. Uh, but overall, across New Mexico, we have more than 20 districts requesting help, trying to keep those doors open in the schools. And administrators say that they are hoping that this is a wake-up call and that people will realize how understaffed they are here at the schools even before this pandemic hit. We hope, yeah, I got it. We hope all your family members recover and that they get those teachers back in those classrooms there. While I have you here, I, I got to ask you, what, what happened? What happened to you? you? You had two teachers in the family. You became a reporter? <laughs> My retirement plan is to come back and be a teacher in New Mexico, and now I've said it publicly, so they're going to they're gonna hold me to it. Yeah. All right, well, they could, they could definitely use you. All right, Gotti Schwartz for us tonight. Gotti, thank you for that report. Now to Top Stories Global Watch and protests in Mexico over a recent string of journalist killings. Vigils and demonstrations held in dozens of cities across the country calling on authorities to protect members of the press and investigate crimes committed against them. The nationwide protests after three journalists were killed there just this month. Poland and has begun construction on a wall on its border with Belarus. The 18-foot wall will run along 115 miles of the border, about half the total length. It's set to be completed in June. The $400 million barrier is to prevent refugees from crossing over after a migrant crisis at the border at the end of the last year. You may remember these images. Okay, now to the Americas, where we focus on stories from the U.S. and Latin America. The International Monetary Fund now calling on El Salvador, to drop Bitcoin as a form of legal tender, warning that the cryptocurrency's volatility could put the country's financial stability at risk. Joining us now to break this down is Mackenzie Sagalos, a technology reporter for CNBC. Mackenzie, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. So let's get right into this. El Salvador made really big headlines last year when it became the first country, I think, to accept Bitcoin as a form of legal tender. The president throwing a big party, announcing plans to build a Bitcoin city. Why is the IMF now saying this is such a risky move? And, and when I ask right now, I mean, why are they waiting up until right now? Hey, Tom. So it's actually been for months that the IMF has been increasingly vocal about how much it opposes El Salvador's nationwide Bitcoin experiment. The IMF's recommendation this week to strip Bitcoin of its status as legal money came as the crypto market was suffering a massive sell off in which Bitcoin was down 50 percent from its record high. IMF directors say that kind of price volatility poses a huge risk to consumer protection, financial stability. And it certainly doesn't help that President Bukele keeps using government money to add Bitcoin to El Salvador's balance sheet, which, if the bet pays off, fantastic, but it is a massive gamble. Yeah, um, a massive gamble, as we're seeing right here in this chart on the value of Bitcoin. I have to ask you, you know, El Salvador, they're trying to secure this massive loan from the IMF. Does the IMF now have some leverage? Because the president of El Salvador, as we saw in that video earlier, is clearly riding this sort of Bitcoin rock star wave. 
Yeah, the IMF has a whole lot of leverage right now. El Salvador has been trying since last year to, sec uh, to secure a $1.3 billion loan from the IMF, an effort that appears to have soured over this decision to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. And the bottom line is that they need that money. Under current policies, public debt will rise to 96% of GDP by 2026, putting the country on a clearly unsustainable path. You know, part of the president's plan there in El Salvador was to distribute Bitcoin to use a digital wallet that I think they were calling Chivo, Chivo wallet. How does that work? And have we yeah. heard all of the downside to using Bitcoin as legal tender? But is there any upside to this part of the rollout? Yeah, this national virtual wallet called Chivo offers no fee transactions. It allows for quick cross-border payments, which is hugely important to El Salvador, uh, where remittance payments are a, a huge part of income for many uh, citizens in the country. And what's really powerful about this digital wallet is that users can operate neither U.S. dollars or Bitcoin. And for a country where 70 percent of citizens don't have access to traditional financial services, Chivo is a convenient on-ramp to the banking system, sometimes for the first time for certain people. Okay, Mackenzie, love having you on Top Story. Thanks for breaking down this story out of El Salvador for us. Coming up, Cool Runnings. A Jamaican bobsled team is heading to the Winter Olympics for the first time in decades. More on their incredible journey next, including the creative training method that even got noticed by Queen Elizabeth. We'll tell you why, stay with us. All right, back now on Top Story. Jamaica's got a bobsled team, and no, we're not talking about Dougie Doug. The four-man group qualifying for the 2022 Winter Olympics, which will be broadcast here on NBC and Peacock. It's the first time the country is competing in the event since 1998. Sky News sports correspondent Tom Parmenter gives us an inside look at how they're preparing and the cool piece of advice one actor sent their way. There's only one team that warms up like this. The Jamaican four-man Bob is back. Out on the track and ready for Beijing. Just. It was only in September that you first got in a bobsleigh together. That's, is that right? Is that kind of normal? It's not normal, but it's Jamaican bobsleigh. <laughs> Shamwain is the pilot who rides up front. He lives in Peterborough and serves in the RAF. During lockdown, with nowhere to train, he pushed his fiancée's mini around an industrial estate just to keep going. Even the Queen laughed about it during a video call she held with the armed forces. <laughs> well, I suppose that's one way to train. Yeah, that's definitely one way to train, Mum. It, it, it's amazing. It's, 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 it doesn't feel real. It's, it, it's a great honour. It's a great honour to be a part of that and kind of try and inspire the next generation of uh, Jamaican athletes to kind of take it on from what we do. All of this isn't about glory for us. It isn't about the, the, the fame and the fortune. It, it is about breaking barriers and, and doing things that people don't normally do. It is, of course, the backstory that makes it so special. How four Jamaicans went to the 1988 Games and were then celebrated in one of the most iconic films of the 90s. Feel the rhythm. Feel the ride. Get on up. It's bobsled time. I mean, I think everyone just loves it because they love the movie. Cool Runnings was such an uplifting, fish-out-of-water story that everyone could identify with. No matter what country was screaming, screening at, it was so funny that when they would go like... Um, you know, what well, country from the whole audience would yell, Jamaica! <laughs> and that would be in Montreal, that would be in London, that would be like, it was crazy. Like, everyone just wanted to just root for these guys, and it was fantastic. I'm not sure the value of your sporting advice for these guys, but what would it be? <laughs> Feel the rhythm! Feel the rhyme! You don't know! It's bobsled time! <laughs> And bobsleigh time is so nearly here. They fly to China later this week, ready for the run of their lives. Tom Parmenter, Sky News, Bath University. We thank our friend Tom from Sky News. When we come back, the hero officer, the Los Angeles police sergeant, caught on camera saving a choking toddler. What he says was running through his head when he jumped into action. He joins Top Story. Stay with us. All right, we want to end tonight with a dramatic rescue caught on video. An LAPD sergeant's quick thinking saved the life of a choking toddler about the same age as his own son. Take a look. It all started with an urgent cry for help near LA's Echo Park. Over here, over here. 
That's when LAPD Sergeant Bumjin Kim, who was in the area on another call, leaps into action. Police officer, please, I don't know what's wrong. I had a uh, an adult male running towards me with the, what was, seems like a two or three year old baby girl in his arms. You see this lifeless child being brought to you. What are you thinking? My first concern was that she looked really, really pale. What happens next takes less than a minute, a combination of LAPD training and paternal instincts. A training that we get from LAPD, uh, we're taught to assess the situation, uh, think of the airway, breathing, and compression uh, in, in order. So I was thinking as a child, I have a three-year-old son myself, and he, my son stuffs his face all the time. So maybe choking hazard was the first thing I was thinking of. Sergeant Bumjin worked to clear the obstruction. You know, during the uh, sweeping of the mouth, I thought I felt something. Something came out, something came out. Whatever was obstructing, I believe came out based on the fact that she was breathing and crying really loud. Not long after, Los Angeles Fire Department personnel arrived on the scene, taking the toddler to a nearby hospital. The sergeant telling me the fact he saved the child didn't hit him until 10 minutes later. You know, I thought about my son, um, thought about my wife. If she was in the same situation, um, I could, could totally relate. But still humble, as so many are calling him a hero. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And, you know, I'm one of 10,000 officers with LAPD. Honestly speaking, it could have been any of my officers out there. We thank that sergeant so much for sharing his story. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tommy Almas in New York. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.